The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Okay, uh, so thank you very much for the introduction. And it's uh, really a, a privilege to be up here representing uh, our collaboration, the BICEP2 collaboration, to tell you about the very exciting result in observational cosmology that led to this workshop, the detection of B-mode polarization at degree angular scales by the BICEP2 telescope. And so this here is the BICEP2 telescope, which you've probably seen pictures of at various points by this point. Uh, this is a uh, this small telescope sitting amidst its ground shield at the South Pole, uh, gazing, gazing at the polarized millimeter wave sky, looking for the echoes of inflation. So what I'll be telling you about, uh, since I'm the first technical speaker, I'll have to spend a few minutes on what the signal is we're looking for. But we'll hear much more about that later today. What are these echoes of inflation we're looking for? Spend some time on the BICEP2 instrument, what it, what it is and how it does it, what it does. Uh, review the maps and spectra, the results, and then spend some time on the interpretation. Why do we think this means what we think it means? So uh, we can begin at the beginning, which is literally true in this case, which is a rather remarkable thing to be able to say. It's generally remarkable that we have this quantitative understanding of the structure and history of our cosmos, dating from its birth in a hot, dense state 14 billion years ago to the astrophysics we see through telescopes today. And this, you know, this is a very remarkable chart showing time advancing from very small times to long times. And on the left is particle physics, nuclear physics, atomic physics, and on the right is astrophysics. And it's just uh, the past 50 years have led to a remarkable advance in understanding about our universe. So the beginning of this is, the beginning of this in our current model is inflation, this epic of very rapid expansion that get, leaves the universe in the fundamentally homogeneous, isotropic, well, boring state that it has on the very largest scales. And that's been a remarkable success in setting the stage for the expanding structure forming universe we see. So inflation will be talked about by later speakers. But the general picture, of course, is it's, it not only explains the boring physics of the very, very large universe, homogeneous, isotropic, spatially flat, but it also has the remarkable property of making the universe interesting, of imprinting, cosmo, of imprinting quantum fluctuations on cosmological scales. So crudely speaking, quantum fluctuations in whatever field drives inflation, it's called the inflaton, will get blown up by this cosmic expansion and become imprinted on very large scales, essentially white noise, quantum white noise imprinted onto the universe. And this produces a nearly scale invariant spectrum of density perturbations. And these are what we see today. They're seeing the density perturbations that uh, we see as uh, hot and cold spots in the microwave background. And they're also seen in us. Everything that is around us, all of large scale structure in the universe in this picture is derived from the gravitational collapse of these quantum fluctuations, which is just a really remarkable statement. So this picture's been enormously successful, but it has one more prediction, which is that there also would be quantum fluctuations that, if, that affect the tensor modes of the metric. So these appear as primordial gravitational waves. Again, a nearly scale invariant spectrum of these over all, ang over all scales on the sky. And it is these we'll be looking for. And this is, it's very hard to get such a spectrum, as I understand it, from anything but inflation. Impossible is a tough word to say around theorists, but very difficult at least. And if you see this, not only is it a unique signature that inflation happened, but numerically, if you know the amount of power in the gravitational waves and the amount of power in the density perturbations that we've seen, the ratio, the tensor to scalar ratio R, is a measure of the energy scale at which inflation occurred. So this is what we're looking for. This is what's so exciting. And that brings us back to our picture of the universe. What we're going to be doing is looking for the signature of inflation. And inflation generated density perturbations and gravitational perturbations. The density perturbations have grown under gravity and become all of the things. The gravitational waves have redshifted away and are, should be very, very difficult to detect today. Again, impos impossible is a tough word to say around experimentalists as well. But basically, these are hard to see. Where we'll be looking is the effect of that earliest epoch on a somewhat later epoch, the epoch when the universe became transparent. The universe, at about 380,000 years after its birth, goes from being, in a relatively short period of cosmological time, goes from being an opaque ionized plasma to a neutral gas. 
And the mean free path of photons goes from very short to cosmologically long. This is the earliest light in the universe we're able to directly see. So this, is a, this surface of last scattering is, is where, well, this is the cosmic microwave background. This is, we all know this. Um, we're looking for the imprints of these gravitational waves from inflation on that last scattering surface. So let's talk about that last scattering surface. This is the beautiful picture from the Planck satellite. I made the front page of the New York Times about a year ago, if I recall. Uh, this is the tiny tens of microkelvin hot and cold spots on the otherwise uniform 2.7 Kelvin background radiation of our universe. This is the direct glow of the hot Big Bang, the glow of light from that last scattering surface. And I show the Planck image because it's the best image we have on, on the full sky. But it's not the only image we have. Of course, there are many experiments over decades that have studied this, both satellite, stratospheric balloons, ground-based experiments. There's an, a wealth of information that's gone into this to lead to beautiful images like this and all of its predecessors. So where this comes from, and so in inflation, inflation generates roughly white noise in scalar and tensor perturbations. May not be quite white. There could be some scalar and tensor tilt, maybe a bit of curvature, depending on the model. These are processed by plasma physics to become the power spectrum of what we just showed you. So I just showed you the CMB is quantum noise rid onto the sky, which means I don't care where the hot and cold spots are. I care what their power spectrum is. And that power spectrum is shown here. And this plot is remarkable because there are error bars, though you can barely see them. The data is that good. And there is a theory curve, but you can barely see it because the agreement is that good. And so this has been an enormously important tool for understanding how our universe is, what it's like, what it's made of, from, under, from the fact that that transfer function from whitish noise to this tells you all about the plasma physics of the hot early universe. So this plot here, we'll be talking about things like this later. This is a plot of power in microkelvin squared as a function of angular scale. This is the spherical harmonic L. So on the left are large scales up to the full sky, and on the right are small scales down to arc minute scales. So this is the kind of plot you'll be seeing a lot. So we're going to look for this, these gravitational waves. So where could we see them? Well, they, they, could, they will have an imprint on the temperature spectrum that I just showed you. And it's relatively small, however. So if I show, these are the, the best data points we have right now from Planck at low Ls, so angular scales of many, many degrees, almost the full sky. The red solid curve is what you get from the standard lens lambda CDM model with no gravitational waves. The red dashed line just above it is what you get from adding R of, oh, I don't know, about 0.2. So that's a very small deviation. And it turns a fit that wasn't honestly that wonderful into a fit that's even worse. And so there's a general preference from this data if you plot this primordial tilt versus tensor scalar ratio, combining all CMB data from to date, you get a plot like this, where the preferred contours are relatively low r, r less than about 0.11. So, this, so uh, this is starting to get into the range of testing certain inflationary models with simple potentials. Uh, and this is the state of things. This is the problem. Is this is the best we're going to do with temperature spectra. These error bars are not instrumental error bars. These are sample variants. This is the fact we have only one sky to look at, and there are very few modes of large scales on that sky. So to do better, we need a new observable. Our new observable is polarization. This last scattering surface, we're looking at plasma from the hot early universe. You imagine an electron that's scattering light. Thomson scattering of light by an electron is polarized. So if you, if you have an electron sitting somewhere in this surface, if it sees a quadrupole anisotropy around it, colder along one axis, dimmer along one axis, hotter along another, then that will naturally scatter a slight linear polarization to that light. And again, we're not going to care exactly where the light is polarized in what direction. It's the statistical properties that matter, particularly how they vary across the sky. The pattern across the sky will depend upon what modes of oscillation seeded those quadrupole anisotropies. And so to illustrate that, let's focus on the top piece here. Imagine there's some density wave. So this is a planar pressure wave traveling through the universe. It's symmetric about its, uh, about its axis of propagation. So the, the polarization pattern seen is also, the quadrupole seen is also symmetric about the axis of propagation. It will produce polarization patterns that look like this, alternating parallel to and perpendicular to the axis of propagation. So this is, so this is one pattern you might expect to see. This is called an E-mode pattern. It's even under parity. It doesn't change when you flip this in a mirror. A gravitational wave is an alternate stretching and squashing of space-time. It's itself a traveling quadrupole. And the orientation of that quadrupole is another degree of freedom, which means you can generate more general polarization patterns. And by example, you can show one where the polarization direction is at 45 degrees to the axis of propagation. This is an odd parity mode. 
And this, it can be a little hard to get intuition from this, from the plots you usually see. So imagine many of these crisscrossing on the sky. So this is the pattern roughly around, I believe, a cold spot in the CMB. So this is many of these crisscrossing on the sky, and you can see a characteristic radial and circumferential pattern, curl-free patterns. This is what we'll be looking for in the sky from density perturbations, boring mundane physics, so to speak. The bottom pattern is very different, however. You can see a characteristic corkscrew, pinwheel pattern. This is a unique thing. This cannot be generated by density waves due to symmetry. And so if you see it on large angular scales, it's a sign of these tensor perturbations. So that's our signature. And the lay of the land and why this is so hard is you, know, you plot microkelvin, L, same kind of plot you've seen. The temperature spectra up at tens of microkelvin are now called bright. These can be detected in very, very short periods of time, you know, hours from instruments that are out there today. Although this was uh, you know, Nobel Prize winning work in the 90s, but now it's, uh, now it's easy with modern instruments. The E-mode polarization from mundane density perturbations is about one microkelvin. Remember, this is one microkelvin on a two Kelvin CMB, possibly on a many Kelvin sky in a room temperature instrument. This is an incredibly tiny signal. So let's look even lower at tens of nano Kelvin. Depending on what R is, the gravitational wave signature should look like this. It should peak at angular scales of L of about 80. So this is a couple degrees on the sky. These are fairly large features, just incredibly dim. Uh, the main background to this, it, in a cosmological sense, is lensing. Gravitational lensing will distort the E-modes and produce a lensing signature on arc minute scales. That's of known amplitude, basically known spectrum. There's interesting science there that I won't discuss today. We're going to be looking for the gravitational wave signature at the larger angular scales. And the state of the art two months ago was this. You, we had first detections from, I guess polar bear was, yeah, we had first detections from polar bear of the BB auto spectrum, a detection in cross correlation by SBT pole. This was just starting to be seen, but upper limits from all other instruments, particularly degree angular scales. The leading upper limit was by the BICEP instrument, the predecessor of BICEP 2. So this is what we've got. And that doesn't lead to an incredibly impressive R limit, but this is noise limited. You can build a better instrument and do better. But of course, there are enormous challenges in doing this. This is an incredibly faint signal. So what would your perfect instrument look like? Well, your perfect instrument has to be incredibly sensitive. This means building individual detectors that are limited by this, approximately by the statistical noise of arriving photons, photon noise. Then you can't get any better. So you have to build many detectors. So we need very large detector arrays of very good detectors operating for long periods of time. Uh, then you have to observe from a pristine site where there's not other kinds of millimeter wave emission in your field. Uh, you have to make the map very accurate. Polarization is fundamentally about saying, is there more power in this polarization axis than this one? It's a differencing operation in one form or another. And that means any asymmetry in your instrument can cause a false difference between two things that should be the same and leak the bright temperature into dim polarization. So this is, so we need to have an instrument that is designed to control this. For example, an instrument that can rotate about its own axis to directly symmetrize its response on the sky. And finally, there are other things that are polarized besides the CMB. So you need a map that is, to the best of your ability, uncontaminated. You have to avoid as much as possible or subtract polarized foregrounds. And we'll come back to that later. So for, I should note the team that built and analyzed the data from this instrument. This is the BICEP2 slash Keck Array team, uh, or at least most of them, at, the, at a rather familiar location across campus during a collaboration meeting a couple years ago. Uh, our group is headed by uh, Caltech JPL, Harvard, Minnesota, Stanford, as you heard earlier on, with collaboration from a number of institutions. So this is the team that made this instrument work. And I want to particularly note, because we're here at Caltech, I'll just note briefly that we here are incredibly proud of this instrument. This is an instrument that was built, was designed, built, tested, characterized, and deployed from here directly to the South Pole back in 2009. This is showing a couple of our grad students at the time, Justice Brevik, Randall Aiken, uh, who had worked on the telescope, getting built up at the time. And this is our team surrounding them out in the Lauritsen High Bay across campus. Uh, and I want to particularly note in the front row, as was said earlier, uh, Andrew Lang, who was an enormous part of bringing together this team and this, making this experiment happen and bringing all this about. And he sadly passed away uh, just days before he would have seen the first light image from this telescope. So you can see the telescope here, and you can say it's not your grandfather's radio telescope. This is, looks like a spyglass. It's a rather unusual. It's a compact refractor. Uh, you can see a couple people next to it. This is about a one-foot diameter aperture. This is bicep one in the high bay with John Kovac and company in front of it. If I look at the interior, you'll just see a, 
a, basically a can with two plastic lenses, very simple optics, on a focal plane. The, the focal plane is cooled to 0.25 Kelvin by a uh, helium-3 refrigerator. And the entire box, this, everything you see here, is cooled to 4 Kelvin by liquid helium. And the reason you design a telescope this way is because you don't need a big dish. The, remember, we're looking at features that are many degrees on the sky. That means you don't need resolution. These are features many times the size of the full moon. So you need sensitivity, but not resolution. You don't need a big dish, but you do need optical throughput. The system is designed to provide that. It has a, the beam is about the size of the full moon on the sky. Uh, the, the, and there's, it's designed for exquisite control of systematics. As I said, everything here is cold. That reduces emission from the interior of the telescope. You don't want your telescope to be brighter than the sky you're looking at. You also have on-axis optics. That means it's manifestly symmetric. And more importantly, you can take this entire telescope and, as I said, rotate it around its bore site, which helps symmetrize the maps and separate any asymmetry in your telescope from asymmetry on the sky. And also, because it's compact, it's easily baffled. You can easily defend this from outside light in a way that's hard with a big dish. So this program was tested out by an instrument we've mentioned before called BICEP. These are Planck-style handcrafted feed horn detectors going down to spider webs. This was... Uh, so there's a few dozen detectors. It's very similar to the Planck focal plane. This operated for years on the ground and was the, uh, until recently, the strongest constraint on degree scale B modes there is. Its successor, once that optical technology was tested out for three years, BICEP2 deployed with a much more powerful focal plane, photolithographically fabricated mass-produced superconducting detectors to really add sensitivity. And once we know how to build that, we can build many such telescopes from the ground or from space and to get even more sensitivity. So the detectors are a particular source of pride for us here at Caltech because these were built and tested at Caltech and JPL. The fabrication line is at JPL in the MDL lab. Um, these, are, these are very local phenomenon in some sense. They're now used in several experiments. Uh, conceptually, these are bolometers. You want to measure a very tiny incident power. So you absorb it, which it's weakly linked to a thermal bath and you put a thermistor on it. So a very tiny change in power changes the temperature of this absorber, which you read out. And if you make all this cold enough, thermodynamic noise is low, and you can get great sensitivity. So what this looks like in practice, the absorber, we have these planar fabricated antennas. So what you're looking at here is an array of vertical slot antennas, all gathered together to act like a single synthesized antenna, and an array of horizontal slots. Again, so that now we have two co-located antennas observing the two polarizations. Their sum should give the temperature. Their difference is the polarization. Power from these. It goes through an on-chip band-defining filter, which says what frequencies we respond to, and then is dissipated on this little, literally suspended island of silicon nitride. Power dissipates on this resistor, heats and cools this island. Power changes are read out by superconducting thermometers, tungsten and aluminum transition edge sensors. So that's the picture of these detectors, um, and the fact that all of this is photolithographically patterned means you can make hundreds and thousands of these for very sensitive instruments. So once you have a great instrument, you want to observe from a great location. And in this case, the best observing location for this problem on Earth is the South Pole. So this is the, an old picture of the South Pole Station over here, the runway. And on the right, you can see the location of, of the dark sector lab, where the BICEP, BICEP2 and so forth telescopes are located, and our bigger cousin, the South Pole Telescope, uh, looming across the building. Uh, so the reason you locate these things at the South Pole is because despite the fact that you see all this ice, this is one of the driest deserts in the world. It's very, very cold, particularly during the winter. So there's a six month long night at the South Pole where these telescopes look at dark sky, occasionally see beautiful aurora, galaxies, just wonderful photography. Our, our winter overs tend to be very, very uh, skilled photographers, it turns out. It's a lot of time to take really incredible pictures you can't get anywhere else. Um, so you can see the reason you locate here is because of that perfect air, not just low in water, water absorbs microwaves, but also relatively still. There isn't a day-night cycle moving it around all the time. Uh, yeah, so, and you can also see the two things that we're going to worry about for emission, emission from the atmosphere, not the aurora specifically, but we want to make sure that we're not contaminated too much by emission from the atmosphere, or of course, as we'll get to later, emission from the galaxy. So to do that, we have to pick where we observe in a different sense. We want to observe the cleanest sky we can. And so we've picked a region called the Southern Hole. It's a few hundred square degrees, depending on exactly how you count, a small fraction of the sky, which was chosen to have exceptionally low emission in dust and synchrotron. So this should be a relatively quiet region for anything but the CMB. 
We also pick clean frequencies. We observe in this telescope at 150 gigahertz. This is between spectral, this is where the atmosphere has relatively low emission. Uh, it's very, very transparent is what you're seeing on this plot, uh, which is good. Um, it's also a region where, uh, where the polarized emission from foregrounds is supposed to be quite low. Synchrotron rises at low frequencies, dust rises at high frequencies, 150 should be a pretty, pretty good place to look. And what this patch looks like when you observe, the telescope has a 20 degree field of view approximately, and it scans back and forth across this region, just observing and observing and observing. And the, this is a picture of the Keck array uh, in sort of time lapse, it actually scans quite slowly, uh, scanning back and forth across its region, just drilling a hole in that one little tiny region of the sky, occasionally doing little calibration dips. And you, the reason, you can also see here another advantage of the South Pole. The sky just rotates over you. So if you pick a good bit of sky, it's always up. You can always observe it. Your duty cycle is limited only by cryogenic cycling. You can get really, really good observing duty cycles. And that's led us to produce a very good data set. We've observed this is for three years, 2010, 11, and 12, before the instrument was decommissioned. We have about 60% of the time on sky was acceptable, was data that passed all quality cuts. For the experts, the noise equivalent temperature of the instrument in the end is about a little under 16 microkelvin root seconds. This means that in an order a second, you can observe a difference in sky temperature of order 16 microkelvin which is quite remarkable. It's really impressive for instruments in the field, particularly instruments that were in the field in 2009. And the final map depth when you drill down that region of the sky is an RMS of 87 nanokelvin on a degree pixel. And what these maps look like, as many of you have seen before, are the plot on the left here. This is the temperature map and the Q and U Stokes parameters, the two polarization degrees of freedom. And on the right, we've done what we call jackknife maps. So this is a difference of the first half of the data and the second half of the data. The signal should cancel. You should just see noise. The fact that this is a heck of a lot brighter than that indicates we have good signal to noise. Um, the temperature signal is up at 100 microkelvin RMS, or 100 microkelvin uh, amplitude here. Uh, for the Q and U maps, this is a range of plus or minus three. And you can clearly see excess over the noise. And I, I particularly like personally showing this plot. This is the polarization shown as headless vectors over top of the temperature. And you can see underneath this is all filtered to degree angular scales, just to isolate this one bit of science. And you can see a clear correlation between the temperature and the polarization across the sky. This is what you've seen in stacked maps from Planck and from WMAP, and we see it in high signal to noise across the entire map. This is the TE correlation directly visible on the sky, which for me is quite, uh, quite exciting. But let's focus on polarization. Uh, this is the total polarization shown in just the vectors, headless vectors. The map on the sky, this is a 1.7 microkelvin scale bar. So this is rather small. Uh, and you can see we've apodized, we've ac we have poor signal to noise at the edges, the dominant signal, the best signal to noise in the middle. So we've just rolled that off at the edges. We're looking at the middle of the map is where our science is. And you can see a strong pattern that looks basically like an E-mode. It's these kind of patterns I showed you earlier, radial and, radial and circumferential. So now we can ask if there's anything other than E modes here. So we perform what amounts to vector calculus to separate E and B modes. And we do this actually quite effectively. There's an important work done on making this process as efficient as possible. And you get a B mode map, which is not really remarkable on this scale. But if you zoom in and take advantage of the signal noise of the instrument, you see exactly the pinwheels spread roughly uniformly across the map that we've been looking for. And this is very exciting, but to interpret this, you need to know what we would have seen if there was nothing on the sky, what the instrument noise is, what the backgrounds are. And so let's just, we've put a lot of work into this. So we have a simulation pipeline. We put in, I want to say it's about 3 million CPU hours on a Harvard supercomputer, uh, simulating our entire instrument end to end 500 times with lambda CDM plus noise. And we, with those simulations, we can produce fake maps. This is one of the 500 showing the typical level and color scale of the B-mode signal you expect from gravitational lensing and noise. And this is our actual map, clearly in excess at the map level. This isn't a statistical detection. This is an obvious thing at the map level. Um, and there are key novel techniques I want to time to talk about. A deprojection scheme for beam systematics. How do you deal with the fact you don't have perfect beams without them corrupting your map? And a very important work, some very important work on how to efficiently separate E and B on a small sky map given a realistic instrument. Um, and this let us uh, do this separation much more accurately than is often done. So the real data product is the power spectra. So you can see up at the top, temperature, TE correlation, EE. The error bars are here mostly sample variants. The fact we only have one sky to look at and one small patch of that sky. 
Uh, and again, these jackknife maps, first and second halves, show basically consistent with zero, as they should. So this is what we expected to see. Down here, TB and EB are equivalent to zero, again, as expected. But in the lower left is something that's not equivalent to zero. So you see this is the expected lensing foreground. And this is a substantial excess above that. The significance of that excess is about 5.3 sigma. So there's a, a clear detection of something that is not lensing. And it is a, the shape is a good fit to the expected inflationary signal spectrum. So this led to a lot of excitement. It led to, about two months ago, a press conference at Harvard where our PIs and various luminaries from the field spoke about this result. We met with, you know, I wasn't there, but people who were there met with such uh, people as Alan Guth, one of the architects of inflation, Bob Wilson, one of the discoverers of the CMB. There was a lot of excitement around this. There's a, a lovely YouTube video some of you may have seen of a sort of a publisher's clearinghouse style visit where one of our PIs showed up at uh, Andre Linde's door and said, by the way, we found a thing. Uh, and this has something over 2.8 million views on YouTube. If you haven't seen that, it, it's, it's, really it's a really sweet video. Um, so, uh, you know, reactions have been mixed. So y there, there's a sense of seeing something, uh, seeing maybe a new thing about the universe, primordial physics that was otherwise totally inaccessible from early times. But also some surprise. The signal is quite bright. Can we really be sure that it is that? Um, and so different reactions, first impressions. So let's, you know, skipping all the, the hype and pretty pictures, uh, let's talk a bit about what this could be. Uh, and there are three major things it could be. It could be something in the instrument. It could be that we're seeing some asymmetry of our instrument that is producing false polarization on the sky, and that'd be a shame. It could be that we're seeing galactic foregrounds, something else in the sky that emits polarized light in the millimeter. Or it could be, if it's not those things, it could be that it's cosmology. It could be that it's the signal that we're looking for. So let's talk about these in turn. Instrumental systematics. We put a lot of effort into this. We're instrument people. We care about our instrument. We've tried to understand it as well as we can. And so, for example, this is a table that you really shouldn't be able to read without hurting your eyes from the back row. This is a table of what are called jackknife tests. So I've talked about dividing the data first half and second half and comparing. Them. This is the same kind of thing. We divide the data into various subsets that should have the same signal but could have different systematics. So you difference them. The signal goes away. The result should be consistent with noise if you've done everything right. And if it's not, it might point to what the systematic problem is. So this is a giant table of probabilities associated with various jackknife tests done. And the short answer is these probabilities look reasonably good. This is a variety of tests. Boresight rotation. Uh, the telescope observes at different angles, right? And so you can ask, do you get the same map depending on what angle you observe? You do. You can split by time, first half, second half, things like that. You can split by channel selection. Do some detectors see something, see brighter things than the other detectors? That'd be a sign it's not really on the sky. External contamination. Does the signal only appear when the moon is up? This is a possibility. It turns out it's not the case. Uh, and various other intrinsic detector properties. So there's 14 of these, various selections of band powers. The probabilities are generally quite consistent with being a uniform distribution. There are a couple low values basically associated with the EE power spectrum. This is not surprising. Uh, the signal to noise on the EE polarization is of order 1,000. So infinitesimally tiny differences in calibration can affect the nominal probabilities here. None of these are cause for concern. And the BB values are wonderful. So this is basically what you want this table to look like. We're quite happy with it. We also spent a lot of time trying to understand the instrument, calibrating it. A lot of time at the pole during those three seasons, in the off season when you know, the sun's up and we can actually do work outside, you can, we do far field mapping. So the telescope observes a distant, polarized, a distant source, polarized or unpolarized through a mirror. And this allows us to produce high fidelity beam maps of every detector at every orientation of the telescope and lets us identify any features that we might care about. So you can see the main beam here. This little buddy next to it is actually a crosstalk beam. This is a known property of the multiplexer. It's something we understand quantitatively. It's dealt with in the analysis. Uh, we also measure the response of the two detectors within a polarization pair, those two co-located antennas, as a function of the polarization angle of the source. The polariz polarization efficiency is over 99%. It's limited by this crosstalk, actually. Um, and there's details of this in an instrument paper, but we've spent a lot of time trying to understand our instrument. And in particular, I'll only touch briefly on beams. The, there's a lot of work went into beams. So if you, polarization's about differencing two beams. 
So the two, the vertical polarization and horizontal polarization detectors observe the sky. We difference them to look for polarization. If those two detectors observe different parts of the sky, if they don't have identical beams on the sky, that can leak false polarization in from the brighter temperature. And there's various modes you can imagine this having. You could have a differential gain between the pair. They could point in slightly different places. Their differential beam width, ellipticity, this would link, this would leak the temperature and various derivatives of it into polarization. And the temperature's bright, so this would be a problem. So we've designed our scan strategy. Because we rotate our telescope during observations, these different effects tend to cancel out over the course of our map. We're actually quite good at canceling these out before we do anything. But we've also, as I said, measured the beams. And you can run simulations using the actual measured beams. And this is this green line is the residual false beam mode you expect to get. And this is an RF.2 signal. So you can see the signal would peak out above it, but it's important. You have to think about this in analysis. And we have. And the important part is that these modes that couple derivatives are deterministic. We know what the temperature map looks like. And so we can say, if there were a, an x pointing difference, what mode of the map would be contaminated? The map has many, many modes, and you can identify the handful of modes that would be contaminated by such effects and literally exclude them from analysis. This has no effect, essentially, on, this is very little effect. It's simulated on the signal sensitivity. But it lets us bring these residuals from our imperfect beams down to a totally negligible level. So this was a very important technique for dealing with a real-world instrument and doing a difficult measurement. Speaking of real-world instruments, we spend a lot of time on other systematics. So measured imperfections of Vic of various sorts, such as uh, temperature drifts in the focal plane, polarization angle miscalibrations, that crosstalk I talked about, finite time response to the detectors, a whole wealth of these. And the residuals are shown here. They're really tiny. Between our scan strategy and our analysis techniques, these are really should not contribute any significant amount to what we see. The signal cannot be explained by instrumental systematics. But we can go one better. Because we have more than one instrument, you'd really like to cross-correlate with another instrument. And so that leaves us with you know, who else has observed our patch of sky at, at reasonable depth compared to bicep two. And the answer is bicep one, which is this feed horn, this predecessor experiment I talked about. This is less sensitive by quite a bit. But it's the most sensitive we had up to date. And it has different technology. Any weird instrumental systematic from this new technology that we haven't imagined would be different between these two. It also observes at multiple colors, 100 and 150 gigahertz. So this is an incredible thing you want to compare. And it observes the same sky for three years. So we do cross correlations. And you can see here, black is bicep 2's auto spectrum, and the grayer points are crosses with 100 and 150. They observe the same E mode spectrum, as they should. It's the same sky. B modes, you're dominated by noise. And you can see that they scatter around. But nonetheless, they are all consistent, which is encouraging. And moreover, if you look at the B, bicep 2 cross bicep 1, 100 gigahertz, these crosses, if you study the statistics, this detects an excess above lensing in that cross spectrum of three sigma, which is, again, very, very encouraging. This is, given the limits of noise, there is no other instrument of equal power to compare to. But given what we have, we see power in this cross spectrum that is very hard to imagine systematics could produce. And I'll note very quickly in passing, people often note that these points look a little high compared to the theory spectrum. Uh, the trouble with that is your eye isn't very good at thinking about sample variance. When the this is the full sky theory spectrum. Individual patches of sky will show quite different spectra because it's a small patch of sky. These are 500 simulations of patches of sky like our own, given that theory spectrum. And these data points are not especially unusual, given that. So there is no E mode excess at low L, despite what you hear. It's at least consistent with the noise you expect in our patch of sky. And it's been measured by several instruments, by bicep 2 and bicep 1. Um, you can also take cross spectra with the combined bicep 2 color combined, which is 3.5 sigma excess, roughly the same magnitude of R. You can take cross spectra with Keck. Now, this, now Keck array is that set of five bicep 2s that I showed you briefly earlier, observing the same patch of sky for a couple years since bicep 2 was decommissioned. Now, this is preliminary. That analysis isn't done. We haven't finished the paper on that. However, it's done enough that we can do this cross spectra. And as reasonable human beings looking at that power spectra, we did the cross spectra. We, have to, we want to know whether this is real. And it was really wonderful to us to see that you see the same signal in cross. This really does appear to be something on the sky, even seen in this more sensitive instrument. So that's our state of knowledge about why we don't think this is systematics. It seems totally implausible, given the tests we've done. So if it's not in the instrument, that means it's on the sky. 
What, but there are other things on the sky, particularly galactic emission. So let's talk about that for a little bit. So in principle, any polarized astrophysical emission since the last scattering surface could constitute a background to a measurement of CMB polarization. The, the three major, the, the major components you might worry about for polarized emission, uh, this is a plot from WMAP showing unpolarized spectra. So the levels and, and frequencies are all wrong. But you get the general idea. Synchrotron emission is generally red. It is high at low frequencies and declines at 150 gigahertz. Dust emission is blue. It rises at high frequencies and declines at low frequencies. So these are the two kinds of things. And in fact, when you plot a polarized version of this plot, the reason we pick to observe at around 150 is that these, this should be near the minimum in our sky patch. The, and generally, both of these are polarized because of alignment with galactic magnetic fields. As in the rest of astrophysics, magnetic fields are always the source of problems. So once you have this, there's also point sources, extragalactic and local. Um, they're all possibilities. This could have any spectra you want, but in general, they're localized in space in some fashion. So these are the three things you might generically worry about. So let's talk about them in turn. Synchrotron. Uh, we have data on this. WMAP mapped the entire sky in synchrotron with polarization. And this is their map in K-band, 23 gigahertz, where they have great signal to noise on this. They also estimate what the power spectral index of that power is in our sky patch. It's about minus 3.3 in antenna temperature. So we can take that map extrapolate it, and reobserve it with BICEP2. We know we have Planck's map, sorry, we have WMAP's map, we have their noise model, we have their beams, we can fully pass through through our pipeline and find what you get. And the answer is you get an auto spectrum that looks like this, that's gonna be an upper limit on what you spec, uh, and a cross spectrum that looks like this, basically nothing. And the in inferred R you get is 0 0.0008, plus or minus, Four thousandths, and if you let the spectral index be somewhat softer, you you get uh, minus three, which again is R of about 0 0.001. So even when you add in error bars, this is it sure doesn't look like there's significant power in our in our region from synchrotron. So that's that's the story on synchrotron. Polarized dust is a bit more of a problem because we don't have access to full sky maps at good signal to noise of polarized dust. So we first looked at all the av available leading dust models. That are, that are in the literature. So FDS model eight, bisymmetric spiral, various of these, including the Planck sky model, these are informed by what measurements we do have. For example, IRAS at 100 microns and a variety of other things. These attempt to capture what the galactic magnetic field is doing and estimate what we should see in our sky patch. And we took each of these and again, passed them through our entire pipeline and computed auto spectra, which could be biased by noise in various forms, and cross spectra, which are basically all consistent with zero. So this is quite nice. Given existing published models, there's no reason to think that dust should be nearly as bright as the signal we observe. The, I want to note that we can't assign an error bar to this very accurately because we don't, we don't know what the noise on these models is. We can only show a, a number of models and compare them and say that none of these models show significant power. So of course, we'd like real data. And real data meant we, in this case, means Planck. Planck will have real polarized dust emission models, particularly with their 353 gigahertz channel. And we actually, in the lead up about a year ago, we did request uh, to share data with Planck on this. Uh, we submitted an MOU on this, and we were denied. We requested it again at the time of the uh, release. We were denied again. So we don't have data. We weren't likely to get it. So of course, we as curious scientists still want to know what we can do. And what we did was we added to this two data-driven models. And these are, data-driven model is take the official product Planck dust intensity and sort of update the Planck sky model with it in some sense using a, a PSM angles and assume polarization fraction. And DDM2 is the one that you tend to hear a lot about. Uh, from what you hear, you would think this was the only thing we looked at. And that's absolutely not the case. This is one of one, two, three, four, five, six models that we looked at. And it's also the... Uh, yeah, it's one of six models we looked at. This was based on redigitizing data from publicly shown slides by Planck. And this was gonna be a noisy process. We knew it was. So you can look here, you can see auto spectra in dashed are still low, but they're somewhat higher. But we know these are noise biased. We know that the process is noisy. We know that Planck is noisy. Planck's signal to noise for a dim dust region like ours is not stellar for polarization. And so we compute an auto spectrum. And that produces these lines down here which are very, very small. 
And these are shown because this was part of our thinking. This is part of what we did, part of what we tried to use all available information to look at what dust could be. So this is what we've got. Now, of course, since then, there's been, uh, there's been discussion about whether we scraped data from the pixels of the pictures correctly. And there are differences of opinions on what certain words on the slide mean or not. But the, and I think what we've sort of learned from this is that lacking guidance from the authors of what was actually done to process to produce those plots, it's very difficult to use them. We also lack uh, a noise model from Planck. We lack a lot of information we would need to do something super accurate. So we did this as a best effort based on what was publicly available, because if we didn't do it, then someone would ask us if we'd done it. But at some level, we, this is all we can do given current data. Now, of course, Planck has since released a paper just a week or two ago that shows the polarization fraction and other data products across the sky. Um, this excludes about 21% of the sky. Uh, our sky region lies right about there. Um, and, <laughs> which was frustrating, but the, 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 there's, not, there's not necessarily some conspiracy here. It's more that if you look at the paper, in this paper we only show the Planck polarization data and derived quantities where the systematic uncertainties are small and where the dust signal dominates total emission. They're showing the dust where the dust is clearly very bright and computing polarization parameters is relatively straightforward. Systematic errors and noise make it quite difficult to, you know, noise bias is a real issue. And so if Planck doesn't show confidence in exactly, in releasing exactly what the polarization properties in that region are, I think to some extent we have to live with that for the moment and wait and see. So that's roughly the state of, that's roughly the state of dust is that we, hope that there'll be more information coming from Planck, but given all available information and models, it looks very small compared to what we've seen. And then touching briefly at the end, um, so I've talked about synchrotron, correlation with WMAP, dust, it's brighter than models, there's no cross-correlation in the models we've come up with, and the angular spectrum, I didn't really mention this, it's, it looks like a gravitational wave signal and foregrounds on average tend to look relatively red in this angular power spectrum. Point sources, I'll say only briefly, we correlated with various source catalogs. We don't see anything. It's unreasonable that extragalactic sources could contribute much because an extragalactic source, the polarization should be essentially random. They shouldn't coherently add up to a significant signal. Uh, there has been discussion of things like radio loops and surprising features in the galaxy. Um, to my knowledge, there isn't much of a quantitative prediction of what those actually should look like in our field, so can't really do much with them. Um, there are features like this across a good bit of the sky. Uh, and for any such localized source or extended source, you have to think about shouldn't, if it's emitting in synchrotron, it should at some level be in the WMAP map. And if it's emitting in dust, it should at some level be in the dust maps. And again, you know, as more information comes out, surprises can happen. But as far as we know, there's no particular cause to worry about localized sources. We also did one more thing, spectral index constraint. So we have, Bicep 2 at 150 gigahertz, bicep 1 at 100. We can cross-correlate them. And the cross-correlation will have about the geometric mean of the error bars. And so that would give us some constraining power. Is the signal the same brightness in both? And I quickly show for E modes, which are easy. Remember the E mode spectrum. It's very, very bright. You get exactly the expected CMB value. And you rule out, not surprisingly, a pure dust or synchrotron model at a lot of sigma. So this isn't surprising. This is what we expect. We can do the same thing for B modes, where the statistical noise is much higher. And again, you find a curve like this. It's consistent with the BB signal being, uh, being consistent with the CMB to within one sigma, and you disfavor synchrotron and dust as single component emissions. Remember, this is only investigating what if everything we saw was dust, everything we saw was synchrotron. Those are disfavored at about two sigma. So this is crude. It's not incredibly high signal noise, but it's something we can do. It's a very encouraging consistency test on the data we have, that the signal really is the right color. So that's the arguments on galactic foregrounds and why we think this doesn't particularly look like galactic emission or other foreground emission in the sky. So if that's the case, we're left with the most economical possibility is cosmology. So let's, so let's say this is cosmology. We can now add co sample variance limits to it. We can fit an R to it. The best fit R from this alone is R of about 0.2. The fit is very good, consistent with large field, gut scale inflation, all the things people will talk about later. Uh, the likelihood curve is shown here. Um, R equals zero is disfavored at about seven sigma, which is quite remarkable. And this is sample variance dominated, which means from this you would conclude 
you need more sky. You need to observe more sky. You need more modes on the sky to get much more information about this. So, of course, how do you handle foregrounds? We talked about them. How do we handle them? And this is actually a very delicate situation. Because remember, we're looking at a bunch of models that are just about consistent with zero. We don't know exactly how each of them represent reality. All we know is the whole collection of lines are roughly consistent with zero. And so it didn't seem reasonable to concoct a number to subtract in the headline value. That didn't seem quite fair. So instead, we've taken these models and for auto and cross spectrum, shown what happens to the likelihood curve from, from subtracting these. You can put your own personal prior on which models are right and which models are wrong and what you think the sky looks like and select from among these curves. But for example, DDM2, which is among the brightest, selects, uh, you still disfavor R equals zero at about 5.9 sigma. So I, I should note that even that you could, uh, most of the weight from any of these models is in the first bin, if anything. And so you could remove that bin and still find a rather significant signal. And doesn't mean, and you would get very little change from our base result. So if you take that at face value, there's some tension with SPT, Planck, et cetera. Remember we had this curve that said R was less than about 0.11 at 95% confidence. Could be that there are other things going on at large scales, small scales that we don't quite understand yet. Um, this can be relieved in many ways. You know, it could be relieved by a small running in the spectral index, by, I'm told, by taus, by neutrinos, by foregrounds, by any number of things could reduce this tension to some amount, extent. We don't favor any particular resolution to this. I think there are many ways it can be resolved. This is not an existential problem. Um, but it's interesting to think about what those resolutions could be. But from our point of view, um, we simply find that the uh, observation we get will be, it will be sorted out in the future exactly how it relates to the, the Planck low L values. There are many ways to do so. So of course, we've continued working, and I won't talk about this. I'll leave this to Jamie. But we've continued observing at multiple, with more powerful instruments, at multiple frequencies from the ground and the air. There'll be a lot coming from us uh, in the future post BICEP2. But the conclusions for now are that these are the deepest polarization maps ever made. There's this five sigma or seven sigma excess that is rather remarkable and looks just like it should look for a primordial gravitational wave signal. Extensive studies disfavor a systematic error origin. Foregrounds do not appear, given existing data, to con constitute the bulk of the signal. The no foreground constraint is R of about 0.2. And this is consistent with expectations for primordial gravitational waves from gut scale inflation. And this is our sort of finishing plot showing the upper limits from previous instruments. And now, just this past year, the beginnings of B-mode cosmology, the beginnings of data in this field, which is going to be extremely exciting. And of course, our, the papers and data products are posted on bicepkeck.org. And that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. So I believe we have plenty of plenty of time for discussions. Uh, Mark? Yeah, for EE? Yes. So can you say what fraction of the upper limit on the fraction of the EE signal coming from that? Um, I've thought about this a little bit. Uh, so the question was what fraction, looking at this, what fraction, um, what constraint can you set on how much dust could be contributing to this uh, given this? So where you might, you, if you wondered if this was a signature of dust, you can ask if, there's, if, that's, uh, if there could be a significant dust contribution in the EE. Um, we've, I, I've thought about this a little bit. It's not totally, it, it turns out that the limits on small excesses are quite hard. So you can say that the, the bulk of the signal is definitely CMB, but could you fit in, I don't know what the exact number is, but you can fit in small fractions of something else. So one fifth of that I would have to check that number. That sounds high, but I don't want to quote you a wrong number. It's not an, we don't have an official number on that. I'd have to check. But because dust would contribute excess absolutely power, it would. wouldn't it? Absolutely okay. it would. We, we mostly show this uh, because we've gotten uh, occasional questions about, well, you know, beta of minus 0.7 is a weird sort of value. So if this is shown sort of to show the method works, and you actually do pick out this is the true CMB index. Uh, I'd have to get back to you on what exact fraction of dust could be fit in. I don't know the number off the top of my head. I don't want to say it wrong. Any other question? Yeah, so um, there's a paper on the archive last week about just some uh, accounting of the of 
the comparison of R with plonk, plonk versus bicep, right? So if it's done at the same scale and the and if the pivot is if the pivot scale is the same, and then the assumptions for whether you use any NT or no NT. Or, so, um, so I read the paper, but I didn't dig in deep enough to know if they're right in everything they say there in how the comparison was done. So do you know what I'm talking about? I know exactly the paper okay. you're talking about. Uh, <laughs> that, and this was one of the ways of resolving that I sort of skipped over is there's this question about what exact scale you measure uh, the tensor, um, the tensor scale ratio R. And I am not personally up on exactly what the solution was. Uh, does someone else on the team happen to know what the resolution of that? I know we investigated the same thing internally. I'm trying to remember. Uh, do you remember Grant or, or Jamie? I, I think the paper was if you convert the Planck number to our definition, it's like 0.138, their upper limit, if I've got that. Right. That yeah. sounds right. Right. Basically, it's that it's just quoting, you know, of course, what you quote as R depends on what scale you quote at. And so right. it's, just, it's just a matter of convention. But in this conversation of, you know, I'll put quotes around even the word tension with plot, you should be quoting the same number. And my understanding is it's not quite the same. It's number. not the same number. It's not and quite the same. The number goes up. And we've done that analysis, and it's similar. Um, yeah, that, that's all I can say. We, exactly we have looked at the same thing. And that's a good point. Right. Okay, so, so in this, you know, in this, if you go back, if you go, go to your second to last slide. Okay, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, there. One. So I think, is it true then that on the right, it's actually the y-axis is two different things for when the, it's the, plonk? The, the right is a little bit weird because um, this is including running as well. So I would have to, this explicitly says 0.002, but uh -huh. I, I mean, you're, you're, what that paper is arguing is that this curve moves a little bit with respect to our data if you choose a common pivot scale which we may not have done correctly. So um, that, that is what that paper is saying. I, am, I cannot. So is your r equals 0.2 uh, value the same y-axis as shown on the left is the question, the 0 0.002 scale? It, it's not. Oh. Our convention is slightly different. Yeah. And that's, and we should. Yeah, yeah uh, part of the question here is there's actually two pivot scales. There's a scalar pivot and there's a tensor pivot and they don't necessarily have to be the same. And here it's a little confusing, even though it says R.002, what we are assuming in our paper is that N sub T is zero. Planck assumes that N sub T is minus R over eight. And so they need an extra pivot scale that we don't need. So even though it says R.002 there, it really doesn't matter what the tensor pivot is there, but since it's the tensor to scalar ratio, Actually, the N sub S part depends on an, a 0 0.05 convention. Uh, the paper that you're mentioning gets it right. Um, they conferred with uh, Clem and Stefan from our group, so okay. you can kind of rely on that. Okay. Uh, okay. If it's unclear, there's also the CAM init file that says what our parameters were that we used. Right. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Eva? So you kind of mentioned in passing that it's hard to as, as, assign an uncertainty even to the dust models. And then it's become clear that people get different answers for DDM1 and DDM2, depending on how they do things evidently. So given that, are you claiming an over five sigma detection above four grounds, or are you not claiming that? The, it is difficult to claim an over five sigma detection over an uncertain thing. So the, you're right, there could be Given all existing expectations about what foreground should look like and what data we have available, yes, it's that big an excess. But that doesn't mean that there isn't some surprise that was not captured by other data. So I can't commit to that there's a certain level of knowledge. We will have better data in a few months, and we will know that so, so for actually, sure. Can you tell us when the Keck 100 might be available and help settle this? Keck 100, uh, so no, I can't give you data on that. But Keck 100, the first two 100 gigahertz detectors were deployed this past winter. And so they will, um, and so we're accumulating data now. I believe the maps are already deeper than bicep ones, but there's a lot of analysis between taking data and actually getting results. So all I can say is we're working on it. Um, it just, just to clarify, I mean, in, in the paper, we formally quoted on a no, the 5.3 sigma comes from a no foreground case. 
That's right. Just just a lambda CDM with lensing, and we debias the foregrounds, but we don't you know we, we don't have the data for the the dust model, so we don't quote quote a formal number for that. And I was going to show the Plunk, I'm sorry, the Keck, 100 gigahertz maps, but maybe I won't now, <laughs> given all this business with digitization. Yeah. <laughs> So that will be the last talk of this workshop. So um, I have another question about the uh, EE and BB uh, spectral indices. Uh, okay. Do you mind going back to that slide? Yeah, so those are fine. So you said these are assuming pure synchrotron or pure dust components. Yes. Um, we also think lensing should be there, right? right? So if you include those, does that change these results? It, so, well, for EE, not so much. But the, for BB, um, this is currently... I believe it's focused on the lowest bins where lensing is a fairly small contribution. I mm -hmm. um, believe this is a single component model that does that lensing does contribute to. So, okay. so you so lensing is already included in this plot. Let, this is I believe this I believe this is the case that this is in, that lensing is part of this. This is for the total BB in those lowest bins. Okay. So lensing is small, but it does contribute. So you could you could subtract lensing and slightly modify this curve. It's a single component fit, and you're right. Lensing can be subtracted. And in this plot, it isn't. OK, so if you did something like dust plus lensing or synchrotron plus lensing, those might not be as far away on that Gaussian. What, what happens is this peak basically doesn't move. These, these wings will move a little bit. OK. Um, it's, it's not going to move the center very much. All right, and do you have a sense of how much they're going to move? Are you still going to say you can exclude dust plus lensing at some sigma? I, I, unfortunately, that plot I don't have in front of me. It's actually a relatively new plot, so I don't have that in front of me. But it's, um, but it doesn't. the The curve looks roughly like this. The significance would change very slightly. It's still, it's a, it's a round two sigma, I believe. Okay. Thanks. I'm a little confused on the question. Then, how does dust change the spectral index? So, I mean, sorry. How does how does uh, lensing change the spectral well, index? What matters What matters in this is that the lensing you can't. You don't necessarily want to handle this in the same way you did for EE because lensing, um, there's some contribution from lensing here, right? And so what you, in principle, another thing you could fit is these data points minus expected lensing for some assumed value and what is the spectral index of the excess. And that's slightly different than what's shown here. So that's the extent to which it doesn't change the central value very much, but it, it will, it changes significance slightly. So we don't have, I, I don't have that plot. That plot is not a, is not a finished thing. But it, it's, yes, it's a thing you can do. Any other question? Oh, behind me? All right. <laughs> so now that we have the uh, blank dust map for some patches of the sky, if you're a pessimist and you think that, you know, your bicep field was in one of the worst sections of the blank dust map, uh, do you have a sense of how badly your significance of the detection would change. Okay, so there's a, a few bits to unpack in that. If we were in one of the worst sections of the dust map, and there's no evidence we're in one of the worst sections, we're in a pretty good section, whether it's actually what the exact level is, is, is not known. It's excluded from the maps. Um, but it's pretty good. And it's, it's hard to quantify. Uh, I don't want to get into attempting to redigitize more maps with unknown noise models. Noise bias is really important in interpreting this and isn't always accounted for. And we don't know how to account for it quantitatively. We have to essentially trust the Planck collaboration to account for that uh, using their full model. So I can't assign a significance to what would happen if I had a different map that I don't have and I knew how to interpret it, which I don't. It's very hard to give a sigma on that. All we can say is that given current published data and current models, this is much brighter than the dust expectations. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so we can have a 45 minutes break. Uh, meet again at 11 a.m. <laughs>